199 meads. I have made 199 meads at this point. I've made some other brews, of course, and we'll kind of talk about some of these things, but I'm about to hit 200. And uh, it's an exciting number. It's it's really cool. And something I never really anticipated. I, you know, thinking back to when I first started, I was like, you know, hitting 10 and 20. I'm like, man, this is crazy. Like 100, that's going to be psychotic. And now we're at two, almost 200. I had a, a, like a brief pause. And I still have this brief pause before I do 200 because I've, I've just had to have a revelation about some things. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like the need to, to talk about what this mead journey has been for me and you know, what I've been through slash what I want it to be. Um, my tone's a little different today. You know, I'm normally pretty upbeat and peppy and I'm, I am excited. But there's just some heaviness weighing on, weighing on me and just things that make me tired. I mean, for, for lack of a better word, tired. So today I want to talk about that. I want to talk about some of those things that make me tired and what I've learned within 199 meads so far. So first of all, my, my revelation that I've fallen into already is that in all of my brews I've made, I have some that have been uh, fantastic, repeatable things that I would love to do a million times. And then I have a bunch that are, but they're okay. They're kind of not really workshopped well enough to be like a perfect recipe. And I, I kind of stepped back and and counted all of the recipes that I would put as, I'm not gonna say perfected because I think every recipe could be better for each individual person, but how many recipes have I perfected for myself? And truly, out of that 199, we are setting at maybe five or six. That's not a very good ratio. I, I felt a little bit um, underwhelmed by that and I feel underwhelmed. I have a bunch of recipes and I think they are repeatable but not quite that perfect marker. Not the not the point I would say like man this this is the recipe. So I, I want to make more of those and I'm having a little trouble uh, jumping to this 200 marker and saying Let's just keep making more crazy stuff. Let's just keep plugging away. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about YouTube, just crap in general. Um, we're going to talk about all my tests and things. And uh, I, I really just want to be transparent. I hope that this video, I don't want this video to have cuts. <laughs> oh, that is ironic to the thousandth percent. Right as I was saying cuts, my mic fell over. Hello, hello. There probably was a cut there, so that's pretty fun. Okay, hopefully I can't I can't touch the mic, otherwise it'll get mad at me. So, first of all, I wanna talk about the things that I think I'm good at, the things that I also think I suck at. Um, in my whole little journey since I've started, I think I have gotten much better at video editing, um, the pacing of videos, and really the overall structure and like presentation, I would say. Uh, my most recent stuff is probably the best stuff I've done. Whereas if you go backwards in history and you look at my um, my first couple videos, it was they were a treat. Hi guys, and welcome to my first Mead video. So this is gonna be uh, today about the things I have going on right now. And I'm not gonna go into detail about what's in all of them, uh, specifically, you know, with yeast and everything, I'll go into that. Um. And I think I've progressed a lot in that way. And that's a great thing to get better at and, and working towards that every single time to make it more 
uh, entertaining and educational. Um, I think that my understanding of yeast and my understanding of nutrients and general recipe creation has uh, gotten better as well. So I think I'm more comfortable in that regard and that's that's nice. Um, I do think I just have a greater grasp on the fermentation process because of this experience. Now, some things I suck at. I don't think I'm very good at um, always conveying every single bit of information about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And honestly, I've gotten a little lazy when it comes to explaining things because uh, I have 425 uploads on my YouTube channel. And the beginning of it, I would, I would repeat every single time why I included Fermate O or why I would rehydrate yeast or those things. And I've kind of stopped doing it as much recently because I got tired of saying it over and over again. It just gets really tiresome. So I, I don't know, I think I've kind of sucked at communication in that way. So I also think I've sucked a little bit at uh, generally like communicating with my audience and I apologize for that. So there's some transparency. I, I'm not a perfect human being. I kind of suck in some ways. Um, and I hope this doesn't come off as ranty. I just, I want you guys to see what my world is like. And I have a reasoning for wanting to share that with you. So what does my, my um, content flow look like? This is where I've kind of started to hit a burnout. Um, I don't know what every other YouTuber's content flow looks like, but mine, I start about, or I have about 12 to 15 projects going on at all times. So that means that I am constantly updating videos and things. And lots of times those are full-fledged meads, which means then you're you know, documenting the primary process and the secondary and all of those things, which is great to document, but as a constant updating process, it's overwhelming. So like, here's an example. I'm not gonna show you all the titles of things, but here's like what my workflow looks like. I have a videos in progress little flow of things I'm working on. And then because I have so many going on, I'm able to finish some of them um, at a decent pace. And then I put them into a finished file and I have videos ready to upload. Um, I, mean, I have a fair amount of videos ready to upload, which helps save a little stress for me, but it's a wheel and I'm having to crank the wheel and turn it and turn it constantly. And if I stop turning the wheel, we don't go anywhere. And so it's those 12 to 15 projects where hypothetically I shouldn't have to work on things all the time. I still have to work on things. So kind of part of my first level of burnout is just how much stuff I've had to do. If you hear it clicking, it's my, my dog right here. He's been cooped up all day, so I'm going to let him do his thing. Um, so that's kind of my workflow. I enjoy it. I really love the process, but holy cow. Um, I also balance all of those things that I do, all of the video stuff with, you know, having a wife and having a family that, that I want to go hang out with and having a full-time job that I work, you know, 40 to 60 hours a week on. So that that's part of this burnout. Part of the struggle is like, I'm, I'm tired and I don't always feel the motivate, super motivated to come home and record a video after I've taught all day and I'm drained. And uh, I know that lots of people watching this are, are not teachers and you know, that's fine. We need other professions, but it is, if you have a teacher around you, I just want to tell you, it's a draining job. I understand that your job might be draining and I don't want to compare mine and say mine is more, but working with kids is a draining thing. So, uh, you know, trying to get reinvigorated to come home and do a video sometimes is tough. Um, but again, I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm complaining. I'm just trying to be transparent with you and say, hey, this is exactly what's going on um, and just kind of be real. So let's transition a little bit. Let's talk about way before. So meads number one and two and three in the beginning of this process, I, I spent a lot of time um, just making random stuff at the beginning and, and really just trying to take and make some normal recipes. And I say normal because if you know my channel now, I make some rather wild recipes. I was making, you know, uh, apple meads and blueberry meads and just simple stuff that 
I, th I think most everybody makes at some point. So, uh, and I love that because I, I like being able to have those on my list. As I progressed, I started to experiment more and I'd make some more weird stuff and, you know, started made my first boche and did all these things. Um, and just found that I had a lot of fun getting to try new things. As I kept making things, I had some recipes I would repeat and try again, like my peppermint mead recipe. I was kind of bound and determined to get pretty good at that one. Um, I was also determined to get really good at my apple and cinnamon. Um, blueberry is another one that I want to get good at. And like, they're just, just a couple of those that are like little passion projects where like, yes, I want to invest the time to do this. But for the most part, I just kept making new things. Once I had made a strawberry mead, I said, okay, well, I don't need to worry about making another strawberry mead. Now I'm just going to go and make a elderberry mead and, you know, and just kind of circle around, never coming back. Well, I'm not even circle around. That's not a great analogy. Really just keep running forward. Never circle back to say, wait, what about that strawberry mead? How can I make it better? Which has gotten me to this point where I'm I'm now 199 meads deep, and I've only made I've made probably 160 different kinds of mead, and fruits and spices and combinations. So, uh, which is cool, but I want to I want to be good at a few things, not a bunch. One of my favorite things my channel has grown to be is this uh, I want to say hub for mead scientific tests and um, just different series. So I, I have quite a few different series. I can show them all. You know, I have um, Can It Be a Mead? Should It Be a Mead? The Yeast Shootout series where I shoot out, where I take two different yeast with the same recipe. Um, I have palate expanders where I just taste mead. Um, what else? <laughs> I have so many series now that I can't even remember everything. Uh, I just have, I have my hands full with a bunch of different things that are all fun and I enjoy aspects of every single one of them, but they're still taking up time and effort. So the tests I'm kind of refer to are, are I wrote them down. And so I have put a bunch of things to the test, like are raisins nutrients? I made that video and then I had a bunch of, of yahoos hop on there and go, well, you should really be testing, do chopped raisins provide nutrients? And so guess what I did? I went and chopped a bunch of freaking raisins up, threw them in a brew, and did the same test. Are chopped raisins nutrients? And found the same result. Um, do, does yeast rehydration matter? I've done that test. I've done bagging fruit versus not bagging fruit. Primary versus secondary. Does heating your, your uh, honey matter? Varying yeasts in a brew, can you taste sorbate or metabisulfite, uh, different kinds of clearing methods. I put to the test a bunch of like, I would say important things in our mead making community and I had a lot of fun doing them, honestly. One of my favorite things was getting to, to do those and learn for myself what was truth and what I think is not truth. Now, here's where it gets really frustrating. In all of these tests, I, the, the thing with YouTube is, you can pour your heart and soul into a video, a concept, an experiment, and then you still have some just jerks, I mean, for lack of a better term, who hop on the video and nitpick at you and say, well, you did this wrong or whatever. And I, I hesitate to say nit, nit, nitpick or say that I don't want people to, to give feedback because I think feedback is valuable for every creator. but. These people will either a nitpick at the the dumbest things for one that are irrelevant to the the tests I do, or they will just based off of information that they they have no evidence of, they will just start spouting things and calling you an idiot and saying, well, this shouldn't be trusted, or, well, one time I made and you know a mead with raisins and it fermented out. Okay, well. Great, that's fantastic for you, but that doesn't prove the point that they are the, the proper thing. I don't want to harp on that one, but that's just an example. People are unwarrantedly giving their opinions and believing that they are spitting out fact, and it's just not true. A lot of the things that people post um, are true, and there are a lot of people who have no idea what they're talking about. And until they experiment and do things for themselves, they're kind of making things up. 
So that's always frustrating. And uh, I kind of had a, I don't know, this this is weighed heavier on me recently because there's a YouTuber by the name of William Osman, who is this, uh, he's a, I don't know how to describe his channel. He's a YouTuber who makes scientific-ish based videos where he just does silly stuff and he's got a really fun personality. Anyways, he posts all these things and he does stuff for fun, but he, in the same light, like every YouTuber, gets gets the same negative comments. And he made a big video about how he just kinda is pretty exhausted from the whole whole ordeal. And how he, he kinda talked about how um, we can get 100 positive comments and then end up fixating ourselves on the negative. Now, I'm not saying it's correct for us to do that, but that is kind of what happens with it. So, um, that's where I that's where I've started to feel a little bit uh, overwhelmed. And again, I don't want to say please don't comment on my videos because that's not what I'm going for. Um, what I'm saying is that it is as somebody who wants to help educate and. Uh, be a part of this community, I can't just like ignore comments. There's no filter on YouTube that says, hey, only give me the positive comments. And I I don't want to, and I will not, be um, shadow banning people from my channel for commenting things. That's just not what happens? I just don't want to do that. I, I, at the end of the day, I want to be true and give those people a voice because I think everybody needs a voice, but it's hard to fixate or not fixate on the uh, overwhelmingly, I don't say annoying, <laughs> the comments that are heavily critiquing things. So that's a personal problem and I'm not saying it's fixable by anybody, but I want to be, I want to be true to my comment section and let sh let you comment freely um, as this goes along. And I'm sure I'll have some people that are going to get in the comments and go, well, you just need to not read comments. That's not really possible when you're trying to educate people. You have to be available to talk to people. So I don't know. I could, I could just not read comments. And I don't know that I want to do that because at the end of the day, comments are crucial for um, people to rely on my data I give but then also to like I don't know to form to actually understand opinions if I say something and then 10 people in the comments agree or disagree uh, then there's there becomes more truth or <laughs> not truth okay so that's a little frustrating part of this whole experience has been like dealing with commenters. And uh, I've, I've, I try to reply to every single comment I get on all my videos and I do pretty well, but that's the a woe of my problems. So this kind of, all of this complaining in the beginning leads me to ask the question, what now? What is the, what is my goal now when it comes to brewing? When I get to brew number 200 and you know, I'm starting to go along to 200, 250 and those things, what do I want to be better at? Um, what do I want this channel to look like? I think the truth is I like where the channel is at in that it is a a, a hub for information and entertainment. But I'm also, um, I'm tired, <laughs> I'm tired. It's been four and a half years of making content. I made two to three videos a week for four and a half years. And uh, it's, it's tiring and you can only make so many videos that aren't repeating. For example, traditional mead videos. How many different traditional mead videos does the world need to see? Not that many. I mean, I understand like there's different varietals of honey, but it's the same process. I guess if you're curious what coriander honey is like versus whatever of avocado blossom, like sure. But I don't know that I need to make 12 different traditional mead videos. 
So one fix for that that I found is I'll take my tr whatever kind of honey I have and I'll make a traditional and I'll do a recipe. And in the same video, I'll put, hey, this is a coriander traditional mead. And then this is a coriander mead uh, honey mead with strawberry and cinnamon and you know and, and and do that and give it a little variety but uh, eventually i'll run out of those videos too um i could do continue to do tests and things but they just take a ton of time and a ton of research and, and things and i enjoy doing it but it becomes cumbersome and tiring and so for example like the 25 percent mead video i don't know if you've seen this before but uh or seen it i did that video four different times. I recorded it the first time with the yeast and I tried to push it to 25% and then it didn't work. So I said, all right, I'm gonna try again. Attempt number two, didn't get it to 25. Attempt number three, didn't get it to 25. By attempt number four, it had been a year since I started the first version. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of fun getting to, to test this theory out and these things, but I spent all this time and I, uh, posted this video and I got I, I feel like snobby for even saying it like thinking about views because I just I know that YouTube is not like the things you love should not be driven by views but I look at this year-long process of trying to push this yeast to 25% and I look at at the views that it gets and I kind of step back and go was it worth it to invest that much time in the video portion of it because I spent you know probably 10 to 20 hours shooting video and then hours editing video and uh, just hours on hours producing that content for it to get a handful of plays and you know monetarily definitely not it didn't even i didn't make my money back from that video because i had to buy the yeast four times and i had to buy i you know i had to use the honey and so i you know i probably invested 150 dollars into that video and I, I didn't get that back and so you kind of step back and, and you say was that worth it could i have invested my time in a better project in something else in general and that's that's kind of where I'm I'm getting stuck is like I have this desire to make this content and I still enjoy it, but at some point it starts to detract away from the other things in your life. I think everybody can relate this too because we all have passions, we also all have responsibilities, and uh, as as we get older, as I'm learning, as you get older, you uh, have new responsibilities. You know, I got married, and one of my new responsibilities is uh, it's previously was also there when I had to you know, choose my girlfriend, but my now wife is, it's important and it is a priority for me to spend time with her. And it's important for me to spend time with her over hobbies. And it's important to have hobbies, but I think that if I'm gonna be true to, to myself and to take care of my family, that I need to step back and, and prioritize some things more. So you kind of stack up things and go, well, was that 12 to, you know, 25 hours and $150 I invested into this project uh, better than the time I would have spent with my wife. Or if, you know, I've had kids with my kids. And it's, I would, I would say it's probably not. Um, and now, if, if you have the time to do it without detracting from things, then absolutely. But with a full-time job and, and all these things, I, I gotta prioritize things well. Uh, it's tough. It is a it's a tough boat to be in, and I think we, I think a lot of YouTubers get underappreciated for the amount of time and effort they put in. Like my friend BC, I'm doing the most. That dude busts his tail for every single video he does. And his, his production is amazing. His investigation and information is awesome. The dude just crushes it with things. And uh, I, I don't think he gets enough views and, and plays and things. And I wish that he, he would get more because that guy's absolutely crushing it. And I've talked to him about this before too. And it's, 
it's a little bit of a bummer when you pour your soul into something and, and it kind of falls flat. So again, it sounds like I'm complaining and I kind of am and I apologize, but uh, I just, my dilemma is, is do I continue to invest this time? I think the truth of the matter is I would probably, if I wasn't doing YouTube stuff, I would still do these tests. Uh, I would just do them individually and then kind of give out like record the information as it is but just not have that video portion it just takes some stress off of things now is it that hard to throw up a camera no it's really not and, and i think a lot of people are going to go well do you all you got to do is turn your camera on yeah but you also have to you know make sure you make it look nice and edit it nice and and do all the things correct otherwise it the video itself will fall flat for that reason so uh it's it's a bit of a game Anyways, my point of that little spiel is that I uh, I got a dilemma, and that is whether or not to invest more time or less time into some of these things. I also have content ideas, but sometimes uh, they're financially pretty tough to do, and so I don't always do the things I want to do. So I have a couple uh, a couple things I've learned, I've, I've written down. And I'll just kind of run through them. Uh, number one, yeast, I, I wrote down, yeast nutrients help your brew immensely. I uh, I know this is gonna trigger some people and they're, you know, you could hop on whatever natural winemaking Facebook group. <laughs> Sorry, that dropped again. This is not a good stand for this mic. You can hop on the Natural Wine Facebook group and you can talk about potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite, any of these like things or even yeast nutrient, you know, Fermade K. You can start to talk about this stuff and you'll get like flogged essentially in the social media sphere about how wrong you are and, and things. and. I know that people are going to get triggered about that, but I've noticed in my experience that yeast nutrient have helped my brews ferment really well. And normally, yes, it yields, unless you start with an insanely high gravity, it yields a uh, brew that ferments out completely. And again, I think that's fine. I don't, I don't have any problem with that because I don't mind back sweetening. Um, but that's kind of one thing I've learned is yeast nutrients are very helpful. Now, uh, some other ones. I, on the line of um, sorbate and metabisulfite, I've also found that um, they themselves do not create weird flavors. And I put this to the test. You know, I did it itself. I, I made a brew and, and did a big old. I don't, I'll just put the video down in the description, but I tested this theory and I found that sorbate and metabisulfite did not create any off flavors. And I was happy with that. Now, not everybody's going to agree. And some people are going to say, well, I can detect it and uh, it's fine. But I've noticed again, this is my experience. Number three, honey varietals matter. This sounds silly, but at the end of the day, your honey, not only just it, whether it's unfiltered or raw or whatever that that information matters but also the kind of honey you use in the location of honey uh, i did a test one time where i took two blueberry honeys and i made meads with them and then i stepped back and taste them and tried to find the differences and there were i mean big differences between them so i would say that at that the honey varietal not only makes a difference on your brew but location um number four said you can make virtually any flavor combination work and i i know this for a fact because one of my series is can it be a mead and i've have, i've up to 10 episodes now and i've had some very wild flavor combinations and um you can virtually make every combination of flavors work if you learn how to balance the flavors well and that's where it's tricky there are a lot of um beginning brewers that cannot make every flavor combination work well and that is uh that it comes with time and understanding how to make flavors pop and how to balance and, and those things so that that is an important 
one itself. Asset number five, uh, it's, it is fun to make simple things, but being experimental is where I've learned the most. Now, I, I wrote you there, but I just edited it because at the end of the day, I've learned the most from my experimentation, um, not just repeating the same recipe. So my whole spiel about 199 meads, and I, have, I haven't repeated a bunch, uh, while it has negatives, it also has positives because I have a ton of experience now in flavor combinations all throughout. So I can say that I've tried you know, orange and nutmeg. Okay, great. How many people have made an orange and nutmeg mead? Probably not many. So uh, that, that kind of experience is helpful. Of course, I will still point you to go and make the same mead and get really good at it, but experimentation is very helpful. Uh, number six, variable testing is super important. You'll never really understand whether or not yeast nutrient matters until you try putting yeast nutrient in something and then not putting it in the same thing and doing like basically a controlled experiment. Or to do, you know, what's the difference between using, putting blueberry in the primary or the secondary? You won't really know until you actually put it to the test. So I would say that that testing is really important. My dog is sniffing underneath the door. Hey, shh, come on, get away from the door. He, he really, I don't know what he's doing, but he's having a good time. Yeah, I'm talking to you, pal. Come on. He's just looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, the variable testing, testing, you know, uh, primary versus secondary. How do you how do you know if it's better to put those ingredients in that primary or secondary state? You don't know until you do it. And you can go and trust your, you know, myself or another YouTuber or a, somebody on Reddit. But having the experience of doing it yourself is super helpful and important. So that's another thing. Um, another one I have is that the balance of a mead is by far the most important thing for you to be successful. When I say balance, I'm talking about your acid balance, acid to tannic value to sweetness. Those are the little trifecta. Tannic value is the mouth feel. Is it clinging? Does it kind of wash over your tongue real fast? Um, acid balance is, does it have acidity to it or is it flat? And then of course, sweetness is sweetness. And uh, I, you know, I've had the, the heart of darkness which some people, you know, they hear the name and go, ooh, I've heard that before. And and uh, it's a very interesting mead, but it's a world renowned brew from Kintram. And uh, that mead itself was very fantastic. And it was fantastic with some interesting like challenges with it. So it was very sweet. It was also pretty acidic, but because he had so much sweetness to acidity, he balanced them really well. And of course, he had tannic value as well. But um, he kind of had this good balance of things. If he had stripped away and did not have the sweetness and just the acid and tannin, then it would be a completely different brew. Or just the sweetness and tannin and no acid balance. It'd be a different brew. So finding and understanding balance is going to be is a game changer. And I wish I had done more experimentation in the beginning with malic acid, tartaric acid, citric acid, and just kind of tested to see what the differences were and how to use them. Because knowing how to use them now, I can take a brew and go, hmm, this apple, this sizer is kind of flabby. It needs some acid. Well, I know citric is very bright. I don't want to go too bright. You know, malic is what apples have. So maybe it just needs a little more malic acid or maybe it needs tartaric, which is more grape acid and you, you can kind of take some acid and blend it and just do some more experimentation rather than just go oh I don't know how you add the acid balance and then you just bottle it so had I known what to do there I probably would have overcome some obstacles earlier on um, I'm trying to think of some other things I've learned those are just the ones I wrote down I would say it is very important for you to brew for yourself. And uh, this kind of will lead me to my next topic, but I've made a lot of mead for, for YouTube. I mean, really, I made it for myself out of interest, but uh, in the desire to grow the YouTube channel, 
I've had to just continue to make content. And so there's some meads that I was not as enthused by, honestly, and but I had to make them because I needed content. And um, I, I just had to push things out. So I would make make a brew and, and it would it'd be okay, but I wasn't just like passionate about it. So make beads for yourself, make them for your friends, of course, but at the end of the day, like your taste buds are gonna be the ones that matter. Now, if you're going to go start a commercial brewery or meadery, rather, um, of course, you want to have the OK from your from uh, surrounding people, too. But for the most part, most of us are just home mead makers as it is. That kind of leads me into my next little thing, which is with making two videos a week, um, I very well could go the route of splitting up my videos into two or three parts. So let's say that I want to make a, um, I don't know, a elderberry mead and so I, I make the primary I the video is what 12 minutes long and I throw the video out there and say it's part one and then I come back and it's like okay well now it's been we're in the secondary slash you know beginning of aging stage what's it like now here's here's what I've done and then cut the video and then you have a final one that is okay well now what does it taste like I, I think that uh I think I could switch to that, but I don't enjoy that kind of content. I don't think that, I think there's a little bit, and I'm sorry if I'm offending some other YouTubers, but I think there's a bit of laziness to that side because I want to honor your time. <laughs> and, you know, as, a, as somebody who watches YouTube videos, I get so frustrated when people just linger on like the most basic idea you know a video that could have been 10 minutes um is now you know 30 minutes because they just they slowly did things uh so i i don't like to dilly dally around now some people like their content and that's fine but i don't personally so i don't choose to do that and i won't choose to do that but it does make my videos harder because i have to have a one shot beginning to end process for a video so a bit of a challenge there um uh, but I, I don't plan on switching to three part or two part videos if if that is a resolve that you would give for me that leads me to my kind of final three points am i still having fun absolutely i still love i love being part of the community um i have some interest in uh, being a greater part of the community. I would love to get BJCP, BJCP certified so that I can judge some competitions. Um, you know, I, I was gonna go to MeadCon and then uh, everything with coronavirus happened and suddenly the the world shut down and so MeadCon didn't happen. So I didn't get to go to that. Um, I, I had just some greater goals and I, those things are what push me forward. YouTube is still fun and I enjoy pushing things out there, but it's a grind that is overwhelmingly annoying sometimes. And uh, so I kind of all over the place and I'm sorry, my brain, I have some notes, but I didn't really want to, I wanted it to be true. So I, I ended up, well, deciding that I need to focus on um, more mead competitions. I, I realized in this way of, you know, I haven't, haven't perfected a lot of meads, but I also haven't entered a lot of mead competitions, that I need to focus that. I need to put that time and effort into, into those things. So I'm gonna probably start focusing on that, which means that the YouTube com content will change because I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna revamp a video that I've already done you know, I've already done a Mace Windu blueberry and cinnamon mead. I'm not going to make another version of it. That's That doesn't make sense to me. So um, you won't see that stuff. But I'll still make those things to send off to competitions and whatnot. Um, so I was laughing at the the YouTube is a grind. And some of, some people are going to relate to this. But I want you to understand how frustrating it can be sometimes. The I went on my honeymoon uh, about two months after I got married. I decided because I wanted to honor that time with my wife and I wanted to enjoy it, I would take a, a hiatus from social media, from Facebook, my Facebook group, my um, Patreon, my Discord, um, 
what else do I have? I mean, YouTube, like I didn't post a single thing for 10 days. I didn't post, I didn't reply to comments, I didn't like comments, I didn't do anything. And at the end of that 10 days, YouTube kind of slapped me on the wrist and said, hey buddy, you're not, you're not um, posting content. So uh, you're obviously we don't wanna, you're not really caring, so we're gonna not recommend your stuff. Now, they didn't say that to me, but essentially what happened is they stopped recommending my videos. And at that time, you know, I had a video that was circulating and videos that were just kind of, you know, doing really well and getting some solid views and things. And because I was replying to comments, it, it kept in the loop. After that 10 days, I, everything I had posted just kind of received way less views because YouTube was like, sorry, we're not gonna recommend you anymore. And it's taken two or three months to recover from that, um, from that thing. And that was so, such a bummer because it's like, it just shows like, okay, well, I can't take time off. I can't, I have to do this one to two videos a week and reply to all comments and, you know, be engaged all the time. Otherwise, the channel won't grow. Now, the channel growing isn't like my ultimate priority. Like, I am very content where we're at. We're at the, over 30,000 subscribers. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's fantastic. I really enjoy getting to do this. But the there is a challenge in that um it just it takes up time i spend hours a day sometimes replying to comments and emails and things and as a teacher i love it because i get to teach you but again backing up to the family debacle yeah i want to also be part of my family so youtube's grind i find it kind of funny that i got punished for that um i've already talked about kind of this annoyingness that happens with uh, uh, YouTube commenters, so I'm not gonna go down that road again, but my last point is I have other interests. I don't know if you knew this about me, but um, I do teach, I teach music, and um, I play music, and I love music. I love being a part of music and, and playing it externally outside of, of my job. Uh, I have created multiple albums in the past. You know, I created an album of just lo-fi music that I use behind pretty much all of my videos at this point. And, um, you know, I created albums prior to that on a different avenue, and I love creating music. I don't necessarily have as much time to devote to it because I have to devote time to, to this. And so I, I got to step back and ask myself, well, what am I... Um, what do I need to prioritize in that regard to be to be happy? And that little hole in my world is, is missing, that musical exploration and in doing more with it. So I would love to be more active playing music. I also, this thing, this takes up a ton of my time, but I do, uh, I, I like I said, I play I band instruments, and so I... Um, I, I can play a bunch of different things, and so I like to do these one-man band versions of things. And so I take a, a band piece and then I play the parts. And so, you know, like I'll show you a clip right here of, of one. <laughs> So projects like that take a lot of time to practice the parts, to record the parts, to edit the videos. You know, that video, um, it's like a two minute video, two and a half minute video in total. It took me 14, 15 hours at least to do it all. Obviously that's 14, 15 hours that I didn't invest into mead making. And at the end of that process, uh, I mean, I was super satisfied. I was super excited because I feel there's like a level of like joy that I get from music. I just, and I haven't been able to invest that time. So that's an interest of mine. I would love to step back and do more with my musical journey. So this video uh, podcast, whatever it is, has taken a weird turn. And I'm sorry if you clicked on it thinking um, that I was, I don't know, not gonna rant. <laughs> I normally have guests on these things, but I, I wanted to talk. Before I stepped forth into the 200 Meads, realm and to meet number 200 i want to be true to myself i want to be true to you guys and i want to i want to be i want to be happy 
I think that at the end of the day, everybody should deserve to be happy and do those things. And it's not that I'm not, but there's a little bit of a burnout. The good news is I still have, like I mentioned way early on in the video, I still have 10 or 12 videos I can post. So um, it's not like I'm not sitting on content like after this video comes out, you're not going to see things. You just might notice in the coming, you know, three months plus the a slowdown of content, a change maybe. Um, I might not do as much long-term, you know, experimentation of things because I might focus on music more. I might focus on spending more time with my wife and, you know, doing those things that really matter. And I, I want you guys to know how much I appreciate you and how much I appreciate your support in, th in just being here as part of this community. This is not me quitting YouTube. Um, don't worry. There will be one day when I quit YouTube, um, I there will be a video for that. So uh, you'll see that video. This is not my I'm quitting YouTube video. This is a an update on my life. So I don't have much more to say. I've said a lot. It's been about 45-ish minutes, whatever. I I want you to know I care about you. I care about your opinions. Please don't stop commenting. Please don't stop supporting the channel. If you would like to support the channel to help me do more with um, tests and be able to afford things to do these tests and, and equipment and whatnot, there's a Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com slash manmade mead. And there's a YouTube channel link thing you can um, find if you're watching the YouTube video. Otherwise, get on YouTube. You can support me if for as little as two bucks a month, and that will get you access to my content a week early. And, uh, and yeah, so feel free to support me if you'd like. I understand I'm gonna uh, probably said some things that have made people mad. These are my opinions, so I apologize if I've offended you, but also this is these are opinions. I do appreciate your time. If you've listened all the way through this, congratulations. You have listened to probably the longest man-made mead um, solo rant <laughs> ever. Um, and I appreciate that. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. This next podcast episode that you'll find is uh, probably or hopefully going to have a guest on it. I've had a had a flip-flop of guests recently that have not been able to come on the podcast. So I'm trying to find new ones because uh, I enjoy doing that. But you'll hear that soon. With that, I hope you have a wonderful day, and cheers!